Now you have to understand it's England. He's got his, he's got his, his bait basket and he's got his lunch and he's under an umbrella because it's drizzling with rain and he's sitting on the canal bank with his pole in the water. Now every, in those days in the 60s, every you know, tannery and mill and stuff, they all churned their stuff into the canals. You were brown, not exactly, you were brown. I mean, it's a totally polluted. So there's no fish to live there. Yeah. Well, if some fish lives there and you eat it or something, you die of mercury poisoning. So, so what's this fella doing there? We talked to 380 of them. Why are they there? It's their wilderness experience. It's to get away from them kids and the missus on a Sunday. They're out of it. It has nothing to do with catching fish. And yet all the time we focus on the fish. We need to understand what business we're in. I'm going to quickly move on to say, those are the first three years, I'm going to move on. But before I leave, I don't want to leave this idea of basic, meeting basic human needs and leave it behind. Because it's fundamental. This is a premise on which we build what I'm going to talk about that follows. We facilitate basic human needs. And so, growing up in England, in Liverpool, I, I worked at Scott's Bakery. And I lived in a terrace house like this in Liverpool. And, and Scott's produced all, the, all the, the bread and the confectionery for the Merseyside Conurbation. So, uh, and, and as a teenager in me, 17, 18, 19, I worked in Scott's at weekends, and I worked there on a night shift, and I worked there on vacations. And, and Scott's, it, it was hot as Hades. You start, they started working you up at the ovens. And you had these 10 foot square ovens, and you had a hod, and you shoved the loaves in, and then you pulled them out the other end, and you stuck them down the belt. So you worked in a pair of shorts, it was hot as Hades. Well, after time at Scots, you got promoted. And promotion in Scots wasn't about getting more, you know, getting more money. It was about getting further away from the ovens. <laughs> so Crompton got to finish up as the back man on the slicing machine. So here's what happens. These loaves come belting down. Now, the slicing machines are at right angles to the main belt. So Crompton's job is to fill a pallet. And it's a five by four pallet at right angles. So I take them off here and I put them on my pallet. And when I've done it, I press a button and the pallet goes to Colin Makin. And it was Colin who taught me about leisure, and what leisure was about. When my pallet got to Colin, Colin was the front man on the slicing machine. And he pressed a button where the blades came down on the loaves, and the blades went up again. And then he pressed another button and he went on down to the wrapping machines. So that's what Colin did. He had the best job in the plant. Every couple of minutes, depending on how fast I did my pallet, he went, Ch -ch -ch. 46 hours a week in Scots. <laughs> and Colin taught me about that. He was the happiest guy I ever knew. He jabbered on all the time. He talked about, um, you know, he was a fan of Liverpool Football Club. He stood on the cop and cheered for Liverpool from Monday till Wednesday. He cheered for next week's match from Wednesday through, he talked about next week's match from Wednesday till Friday. He jabbered on about Liverpool Football Club. He coached the youth team on Brookvale on a Tuesday, Thursday night. He played on a Sunday morning. He was on his pub cribbage team and his pub darts team and he grew his roses in his, in his, in his row house, grew his roses and his flowers. And he jabbered on all the time about this and he dawned on me one day. That's who Colin Makin is. He is a fan of Liverpool Football Club. He's a youth coach. He's a rose grower. He's a dance player. He's a cribbage player. And for 46 hours a week, he has to press a button in Scots. But that is not who Colin Makin is. So you see, ladies and gentlemen, he got these very basic human needs. Social recognition, peer group recognition, excitement, exhilaration, satisfaction of achievement, belonging to a group, connectedness to others, feeling of being important, self-worth, knowledge. He got all of those from his leisure activities. Now, you and I are very privileged. We have jobs which challenge us. And you and I get those things from our work environment. But an increasing number of Americans do not and will not. These are um, uh, job, Bureau of Labor Statistics stuff. And here on the bottom it has salaries. And VH is very high and VL is very low. I want you to look. These are the uh, 10 jobs which will have, or 12 jobs which are forecast by the Bureau of Labor Statistics to have the greatest increase over this 10 year period. And you can see the demand of change. These are the fastest growing jobs in America. And look at how many VLs, very low and low, there are down here on the fastest growing jobs 
in America. And so, for many Americans, you see the shift here to the service economy and low-income jobs, for many Americans, they will receive those basic human needs we just talked about in their leisure milieu or their familial milieu, or they will not get them. You and I will get them in our work, but they won't. And those of us in the position to facilitate things for others, forget about that. We don't put ourselves in their shoes. So I don't want to lose that point. We do meet basic human needs, and what we do is fundamental an opportunity for many Americans. Also, individual users are the infantry. They're the lobbying people who lobby for us. In my council chamber, when 15 people show up and just cream the council on something or other, they win. <laughs> okay, how many studies you've got, and how many, you know, how many rational arguments there are, when they show up and cream us, they win. You know, that's just the way it is. You know, because I've got to go down from that chamber, I've got to go visit with them afterwards. And I mean, I, I mean, that has enormous influence. So if my recreation people show up and play K because they're not putting the dollars in, they're not opening something or something, they will pay attention. So these people are our infantry and they're key to that. But I'm going to say that so, so satisfied users are necessary, but now I'm going to move on to my next era. They're not a sufficient constituency for us to win the game with. And so in the 1990s, it's gradually going on top. So people are getting the user benefits stuff. They're talking about user benefits and how important they are. They're tugging at us elected officials and saying, you know, we're terribly important recreation. Yeah, deliver these user benefits, you know, pay attention, and sometimes they didn't get a tremendous response. <laughs> and so Crompton goes back and says, well, why not? We're user-oriented, why aren't we going back? And goes back to his Paul Samuelson's economics text, and he looks, and he looks down here and he says, well, if you're facilitating user benefits, who benefits from that? Well, the individuals who participate. So when I ask the next question, who pays, the answer is, Individual users pay the full costs. If, I'm, if users are benefiting, they should pay the full costs. But they don't. Because over here, the community through the tax system is paying something. And if I go up and say, well, if they're paying through the tax system, who should benefit? The answer is a large proportion of people in the community, in a democracy, I guess 51% or more, should benefit. And so they should be delivering community widespread community benefits if I'm going to get tax subsidy. And they weren't. They were, they, they were deal, focusing on user benefits. So gradually it's dawning on Crompton, I've got what I call my line of incongruity. I've got focusing on user benefits in the 1990s, but they're supported by tax resources. No, can't do that, can't sell that. Either users pay for the whole thing, or those tax resources have got to provide community benefits. And it's dawning on Crompton, user benefits, necessary, not sufficient condition, can't win the game with user benefits. So, user satisfaction, Crompton concludes, is an inadequate measure of the success of park and recreation agencies. Why? Because most taxpayers are not users of most of our services. And so, why should they support them if they're not users? You need a wider base of support to survive. It is Crompton suddenly realized, begins to realize, that off-site benefits that count highest, not the on-site benefits. By that I mean the people off-site who never go near to the site, how do they benefit? Because their taxpayers are paying, rather than the people who are on the site who are getting the benefits. You will find, I don't care any fancy campaigns about outdoors you, you have, you'll find it challenging to get Bert and Ethel out in your park. I mean, you can't, you're not going to get them out in your park. But you do need their vote and you do need their support. And so how are you going to demonstrate you get their support? That's the future of recreation. In demonstrating to the wider body who don't go to the park how they benefit from it. And so the Phineas Field sine qua non, its purpose, if you like, is that it performs a necessary service for the community beyond responding to the demands of particular use. It's about necessary service for the community 
beyond responding to the demands of particular user groups, where the key to our future lies, because that's where the political constituency is. And so gradually Crompton's getting it in the 90s. He's slow, but he's getting there. Community benefits focus is where we have to go. And so it has a eureka moment. It came in 1990 when one of my good friends in England, Sue Glyptis, who wrote a lovely little book called At Leisure and Unemployment. I was reading through this one time, and this paragraph just hit me. It was one of those eureka moments. She said, the provision of leisure for its own sake still lacks political clout. Sound familiar? It has to show other more tangible returns, such as jobs, urban regeneration, alleviating the links, or you know, whatever, to be worth funding. On its own, it sounds too flippant. It carries real political conviction, only if advocated for other instrumental reasons too. And so Derek's on about health. Yes, yes, okay, that's an instrumental reason I can get somewhere. But for a, you know, to start saying you want parks, someone, someone go fishing out there, or someone can go out with their family and have a picnic, that doesn't do it. There's no instrumental reason for that. You've got to go beyond that towards community benefits. And Sue's book, you know, right, right, the whole horizon opened up for me after I read that. I thought she's right on. So, ladies and gentlemen, what do you see? Do you see some youths playing, uh, youths playing soccer on there? Well, that's the activity, custodial focus, fields for youths to play soccer. Or do you, in fact, see people in there getting social recognition, excitement, ego satisfaction, achieve security, belonging to a group, social interaction, <coughs> user benefits on them. Or in fact, are you with the program and do you see reduced healthcare costs when you look at that field? Or do you see alleviating juvenile crime when you look at that field? Or do you see economic development when you see that tournament on that field? That's where we need to be. That's today's thinking, that's tomorrow's thinking, and the activity stuff is yesterday's thinking. And so it leads us to where we need to go, which is this repositioning focus, the fifth era, and the apex of my five eras in this field. So, the present position most elected officials and taxpayers have in their head is, recreation and park provision is perceived to be a relatively discretionary, non-essential government service, nice if we can be afforded, needs to be shifted, repositioned to position, recreation and park service, so they are perceived, and this is the key phrase, to be a central contribution to alleviating the major problems in a community identified by taxpayers and citizens. Reiterate that. We have to be a central contribution to alleviating the major problems in a community, state or nation before we're going to get funding. That's where we need to go in terms of repositioning. Back to David and Cy back in 1974, who made this statement. I'm cracking up when I read this. I say, we are not identified, 1974, we are not identified with the major problems which confront our total American society, which is a deep concern and disappointment. The field should focus park and recreation services on the great social problems of our time and develop programs designed to contribute to the amelioration of those problems. Hallelujah! And here we are, 37 years later, we're getting it. We're there. We're kind of slow, but we're getting there. You know, this has been around for a while. So, what benefits can we deliver? Well, you can put them in three categories. There's 19 of them, and I've got books on any of them if you want, or workshops on any of you want them, but, but we, can, we have something to do with attracting tourists. That's how we got national parks, right? Had nothing to do with, well, had something to do with John Muir and Thoreau and those guys, but it was really the railroads and the business interests got us parks. Attracting businesses, attracting retirees, you know, um, retirees, of course, being a major economic development tool today, the grand piece of growing number of retired active money people in excellent shape, Enhancing real estate values, talk about that in a minute if I've got time. We reduce taxes, and I can tell you how to do that if you want to talk about that. Stimulating equipment sales, which of course is Derek's business out there. So we have something to do with economic prosperity. We have something to do with environmental sustainability. Parks have something to do with cleaning water, controlling flooding, cleaning air, reducing traffic congestion, energy costs, and diversity. And if you put any of those four, four or five things on a ballot, you win. People always vote for cleaning, they don't vote for parks, but they'll vote for clean water or clean parks or whatever, sure. And then it's alleviating social problems, environmental stress, community regeneration, cultural historic preservation, facilitating healthy lifestyles, alleviating behavior, raising levels of education.